how did I find martial arts? Rather, it's when did people lose martial arts? Hey there, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 426. Today, my guest is Mr. Ludi Lin. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a martial artist who has found a way to make martial arts his job. And the job is pretty varied. In fact, if you want to see all the varied parts of my job and everything that the team at Whistlekick is doing, head on over to whistlekick.com. Check out all of our projects. Check out the store. Use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off. But if you want stuff specifically to this show, you want a different site. Yeah, there's a link between the two. But if you want to go direct, Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. Make it nice and easy. You can find everything we do for this and every other episode, photos, videos, links, transcripts. Everything from the two episodes we bring you each week is there. It's all for free. Let's talk about today's guest. Today's guest is one of those names that if I was a betting man, I'd put down some money and say, in about 24 months, everybody's going to know this guy's name. With roles in movies that you have absolutely heard of and most likely watched, as well as upcoming roles in movies that you are going to watch, Mr. Lin is a rising star. But he's also a martial artist. And on today's episode, he goes deep. In fact, quite a few of the questions that I asked him, he kind of dodged. And not in a disrespectful way, but because he wanted to answer them in a different way. A way that was much more authentic, much more thoughtful. And I appreciated that. We had a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Mr. Lin, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. You know, it's it's an honor. It's always an honor to have all of our guests. But, you know, we're going to talk about some things today that... Yeah, honor's all my life. A lot of our guests haven't had the (laughs) opportunity. Well, thank you. Um, you know, everybody that comes on this show is a martial artist in, in, in some way. And because of that, we have these, these shared experiences, but you've got some experiences that most of us haven't shared in. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about some of that. But before we do, you know, we, we generally kick off this show in a fairly straightforward way. And that's because it helps us understand who you are and everything else we're going to talk about. So Let's start with the most fundamental questions we could have on a martial arts show. How did you find martial arts? How did I find martial arts? It's an interesting question because I get the same question with martial arts as with my acting is, how did I find martial arts and when did I decide to act? And I think, Jeremy, I think the answer is not, how did I find martial arts? Rather, it's when did people lose martial arts? Because I feel like the best actors and the best Martial artists are always kids. I think from the moment you're born, you're in the most flexible state. Um, you're actually the strongest, proportionally by body, um, by body shape, size, weight, um, because you're born like a little gorilla, and you're just way freer to express yourself and to perform. So I guess um, I I think it's not that I found martial arts; it's that I never lost it. Um, and part of that is because I was always a scrapper because I moved, I was born in China, but I moved around a lot. So in the beginning, everywhere I moved to, I got kind of bullied and I had no one to back me up because I was always moving around and alone. And each time you have to make new alliances and new friends. So I was always standing there alone. So I had to really defend myself. So um, it was really from street fighting and actually the video game Street Fighter. So that's, yeah, from scrapping. And then after that, it was really after, during the last years of high school, when one of my best friends really introduced me and took me under his wing and taught me how to exercise properly. And then on um, on kind of a whim, I went on a trip to Thailand and got in touch with Muay Thai over there. And that's really when my, I guess, professional journey started with martial arts. Okay. So we've had a lot of people on the show who have started training in something, you know, often MMA or or Muay Thai. And they look at Thailand as a destination. They want to go, they want to discover 
little bit more about what's trained there, how it's trained, and you know, kind of combine a training experience with a vacation. But if I'm hearing you right, you didn't have formal training in martial arts prior to that. I didn't have any formal training. I was trained okay. on this on in the school of hard knocks on the streets, really. Sure, sure, and I, and I'm certainly not dismissing the value of that in any way. But the idea of headed to Thailand to do some Muay Thai. That's, that's kind of unique, at least from what we've heard here on this show. What was it about Muay Thai that you said, you know, I'm going to go do this? I fell into it. The first time, I didn't have the intention of doing Muay Thai. It was, um, during, it was during a trip after high school graduation. Me and a couple of friends decided to take a trip out there. And we had some time alone to explore different aspects of Thailand. So one of my friends took diving. Another one of my friends took some rock climbing down in um, uh, Tonsai, and I did some, I took to um, Muay Thai up in a little village called Bai, and I've been back there ever since. It's near, um, it's near Chiang Mai in Chiang Rai, so it's up there. So I had, the first time I only spent, I think a month there, and it affected me and left such a deep impression that I knew I had to go back at some point, but I didn't know when. Um, so I started that. And once I got back, um, I explored different other areas, of martial arts, jujitsu, um, of course, wushu and all the memories from when I was watching these, uh, wushu movies, Kung Fu movies when I was a kid came back to me. So that was something I was, was fascinated by and the more I learned about it the more I knew um it's like the more you learn the less you knew and this is so true with martial arts for me as well because I the more I learned about it the more I felt like an idiot and I hate that feeling so I just had to get rid of it so the deeper I went and to answer your question about Thailand I know a lot of people and this is a long time ago um this is probably 15, almost 20 years ago, probably. So I think the scene's changed a lot because the last time I went back to Thailand already, it's changed a lot. Um, the first gym that I went to wasn't there anymore. Um, there's a sort of different system between training foreigners and training locals. When the first time I went, there wasn't. And we communicated mostly through body language, but now everyone knows how to speak American and uh, <laughs> knows how to charge in American dollars. So I'm not really sure what kind of experience people have in mind and what kind of experiences people will have once they get there. But um, if people are interested in it, then um, all the power to you. You won't find out until, until you go and see. Now, what was it like for you as someone who, you know, your experience with anything martial was, as you said, you know, on the street, school of hard knocks, and you step into something formal and i'm going to guess just based on the, the words that you've used it kind of shifted your paradigm of what that might look like it continues you know, what to shift my paradigm okay, martial okay arts, what do you mean yeah. by that? martial arts continues to shift my paradigm and so does acting because at first you think i mean coming from Coming from just street fighting and scrapping and trying to defend yourself, all you want to do is to be strong, to be powerful, to conquer, to destroy. And I think that's something that surprised me about Thailand and Muay Thai is that all the, although you're on the stage, you're in the ring, exchanging punches and killing each other, but they always do it with a smile and they, they do it with respect. So it's more of an exchange. And by the way, to preface everything I say, in the interview, I'm going to attribute and credit it to Bruce Lee, um, Jackie Chan, and Jet Li because they profoundly affected my view of life so much just by what they did in the media and popularizing uh, martial arts into a medium where everybody can enjoy. So for sure, um, a lot of respect to BJJ. Um, so it's like the more you read into Bruce Lee, the more you discover the art of martial arts sometimes is more important than the martial. It's a good balance between the two words, but the art is expressing yourself and finding yourself. So 
the more you learn about it, the more it's not about someone else, the more it's about conquering your own fears, your own challenges. And then it's about exchanging those to affect another person in turn to get something back from them. And that to me is martial art. Mm. One of the things I've said periodically on this show is that if you take the term martial arts and you break it down, art is really the noun and martial is the adjective. You know, martial arts, it's a type of art. Right, that's right. So at the end of the day, it's an art form. It's just about expression. It's just like Bruce Lee had said. Um, I, I, I mean, for I got into martial arts very, at a very late stage. And um, I started being captivated by Bruce Lee at an even later stage. Really, when I first started getting um, martial arts roles, and some stuff is coming from Bruce Lee's own original scripts or based on his character. So I really started reading into him and watching his interviews and getting his persona because that's, unfortunately, that's all we have now. Um, but he was so ahead of his time and his philosophy is really eternal. He can delve into it forever and ever. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, and the impact that they had on you. When did you first notice them or their films? Or I, I noticed Jet Li first because that was around the time. I was born in China. So that was when Jet Li's Once Upon a Time in China and Shaolin Temple came out. That was about the time when I got my first black and white TV in China. And I had a little cool knob, no remote, to change the channels. And um, we didn't have many channels back in China. So whatever's on is on. And a lot of times it's those two movies. It's Once Upon a Time in China. And in Chinese, it's uh, Wang Fei Hong. It was like our, almost the mythical character, almost the superhero to Chinese kids. And this, this person exemplified everything virtuous about being a Chinese person. And to Chinese kids, the superheroes weren't someone different than you. The superheroes were people that trained so hard and read so many of these traditional martial arts tombs that they became, they became enlightened. They leveled up to another, to another league. So to us, that was always something that we can aspire to. Um, so Jet Li really started it. And then, um, and then we didn't get a lot of Bruce Lee in mainland China. It wasn't until I moved to Hong Kong that I discovered this person named Bruce Lee. And, um, but Jackie Chan is always a kid favorite because he's humorous and he's personable and his martial arts are always, are always so varied, you know, um, from the master doing his own stunts, jumping, jumping here and there. It's really cool how, I mean, Jackie Chan, for me, is the person who originated parkour. Bruce Lee is the person who originated MMA. And Jet Li is just crazy cool. Couldn't agree more. I mean, the, you, you've named three people that had tremendous impact on my life growing up for similar reasons. You know, Jackie Chan's humor. I remember the first time I saw Rumble in the Bronx and it just, it, there was a snowstorm. I was at the theater with two friends and we were the only three people in there. So not only are we watching the movie, but we're acting this stuff out. You know, we're, we're sparring with each other in the theater. And it really set the tone for me in a lot of ways. And it sounds like in a, in a similar way, you had the same experience. That's really interesting. That's really cool. And I think it's kind of a shame because I, there, there is a bit of a shame in how I feel about the paths of their careers. Because I work in the film industry, both in China um, in Asia in general and in the West. But I feel like a lot of great martial artists, a lot of great Chinese stars have given up on the West, Western cinematic industry because they weren't given the respect. I mean, how many times, how many times do we see stunts that's been done before by Jackie Chan or, or things that are impressioned by Bruce Lee? and other great martial artists in China, but we never, we never pay due credit or respect to them. In these films, everyone is just so eager to take their own credit. But this is how it started, because nothing is, 
really original. Even Jackie Chan stuff, actually, a lot of his gags and his stunts um, remind me of remind me of things taken from the generations before him as well. There was a real history of it, but here I just feel like sometimes that history is not recognized, and that's a shame. And that's reflected by how many people like Jackie Chan really had a great start with um, Rumble in the Bronx, Operation Condor, um, the Rush Hour series. But eventually, he thought that he was only playing second fiddle to everyone here, whereas he already has more than a billion fans over in Asia and China. So why was he not paid the due respect? He was, he was, uh, he, he well deserved. And that's a great question. And it probably ties back to the way we view martial arts in this country. We have such a conflicted relationship with it in that it's something that I would say the majority of parents would agree is good for their their children to learn, yet most of them are not going to take those lessons themselves. It's something that we hold in regard, but yet it's something we mock. Uh, I think that's really interesting because a lot of American sports are based on um, individual success where you do have a lot of team sports, but even team sports have their stars, like the quarterback, um, uh, you know, like um, um, in, uh, like Michael Jordan in, in basketball or LeBron James. Individual, individuals are celebrated for their success, but really the orig- origin of martial arts, especially in China, it's about the Shaolin Temple. It's about, it's about unity. It's about, um, yeah, harmon- uh, har- harmoniousness. And it's about following in your guru's instruction. Where, I mean, that's, it's, we just come from different myths. That's why history is so important to me. And history has be- become more and more important lately because um, there's a phrase in Chinese called that means you can't forget your roots. And it's not just a fascination, it's not just um, a curiosity, but the more you find out where those roots come from, the more secure and the more stable you will be in whatever you do, whether it's martial arts, whether it's um, your career, or whether it's just being a good person going forward. So being that you're a participant in the movie industry in Asia, what are people saying, you know, from my understanding, certainly as an outsider, the, the path used to be start in Hong Kong, start where you could, and ultimately you tried to move up and get to the West. Mm. But from what you're saying and from some of the things I'm reading about the growth of Asian inspired films in, in Bollywood, that may no longer be the case you know what what are you what are you seeing and what are what's your opinion on that that's definitely no longer the case that's definitely no longer the case the martial arts scene in asia in the film industry has been growing and growing along with the industry's growth um the film industry in china is huge as many would know i think the chinese box office has saved a lot of American movies that didn't, that didn't do as well here. Um, and Chinese fans have such varied tastes. And Chinese fans actually love American stars, but they love all sorts of stars. Two years ago, one of the, one of the biggest box office hits in China that drew the most money was an Indian language sport film based on wrestling, on the true story of a father training his three daughters to the National Indian Wrestling Team. And this film was a blockbuster in China where nobody speaks Indian. Can you imagine this film being America? Can you imagine people lining up outside of the theater to watch an Indian language film about wrestling? No, no, not a chance. It's hard to imagine, right? My imagination's pretty vast, but it's a little bit difficult <laughs> to imagine. But so China, with um, with a lot of films like the SPL series, um, 
and uh, constantly these action-oriented films. They're trying to develop new ways to display martial arts, to film martial arts, and to uh, not just to choreograph it, but to tie it into the story and mixing different forms in a lot of different ways. And that's not to say that um, China doesn't love action films. I think uh, um, uh, Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham Fast and Furious spinoff has just come out this weekend in China, and it's already breached a hundred million, um, wow. more than the box office when it opened up here. So they love that stuff. But to me, a lot of action films or action martial arts films, film in the West, they're based on the formula where it, to me, it's kind of like uh, martial arts porn, and. Believe me, I don't think there's anything wrong with porn. Personally, I haven't watched porn for a little while, but <laughs> we're getting a little bit too too personal now. But what I mean is, I I feel like any film or any art in general that that's made to 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 make the audience want something that's made for an effect of desire is pornography. Whereas martial arts films that is deeply rooted on something and is trying to communicate something that's sublime to you, I think that's a true form of art. And that's only films in terms of martial arts films. I think films in general, when they try to communicate something sublime without outwardly telling you that this is going to be scary or this is going to be action packed or this is going to have a lot of special effects. Um, a lot of times that's really exciting and entertaining porn and people eat that up. There's nothing wrong with that. But on the other side, to really cultivate something in yourself, to feel something deeper, you need to have a mix of the other as well. It sounds like this is something you've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, not just thinking about, I think gradually feeling too. I think that's the most more important out of the two. You can think about things, or you can feel things and then act upon them. A lot of times, I think if you feel it, you're more likely to act upon it. And was it from your time acting that you started to think and, and feel this stuff? Or did that come before? I think it's just life. I think my acting, my martial arts, and everything ties into it. Uh, my experiences, my conversations with people, the books I read, the things I watch, and the things I think about, and the things I see, hear, taste, touch, and feel about. All those things mixed into one, and they kind of, you know, yeah, there's something emergent from that that's kind of strange, scary, and, and really exciting and fun at the same time. Now, of course, we've talked about you being in movies we we hinted at that at the very beginning and the audience is probably saying hey jeremy you know it's it's time to talk about some of his roles or or how he got in something about acting so let's let's jump in there and let's again start at the beginning how did you find acting again like i said i think it's not finding acting i think every kid is an actor um let me ask you jeremy have you ever put on a towel and pretend you're Superman. Oh, have absolutely. you ever, have you ever, have you ever played doctor <laughs> this morning? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> have you ever played doctor? Have you ever of played course. house and all those things? Definitely. Have you ever pretended to be a Kung Fu hero? Have you ever pretended to be, um, dirty Harry? Yeah. Have you ever played cops and robbers? All those things that kids do. It's all acting. And when kids do it, they're really committed to it. And even babies are actors. You know, you know how babies can switch sometimes from just screaming their lungs out to all of a sudden, in a split second, they'll start giggling and laughing. That's acting. They're screaming their lungs out, not because they're deeply sad, just because they're hungry and they're trying to get their attention, your attention. So babies scream their lungs out to get your attention and then when you look at them, they start giggling, going, I gotcha. That's acting. It's just at some point that society told um, a lot of us that 
this isn't life because you need to make money and to make money in a stable way. And that's not entirely wrong. You need to find a career, like you need to become an accountant, you need to become a lawyer, you need to become a doctor. And for those, you know, Asian American kids out there or Asians in general, you'll find this very familiar. Um, this has probably been droned into you since you were a kid. But on the other side of things, I'm trying to promote to parents that the art is very important as well. Um, because personally, my mom had given me this choice when she found out that I got into the arts. Um, she said, hey, get a real career. You can either be a doctor or a lawyer. So <laughs> with that being said, and back then, her spank still really hurt. So I enrolled in um, first dietetics and then went into med school. But after two years of med school, I had two years left, and that's already six years of school while doing theater as a major at the same time, um, all of a sudden one day I discovered, hey, her Spanx didn't hurt anymore. So then I dropped out of med school. I really followed my dream. And it's like those things. It's not when did a person decide to be an actor, it's when did a person not to be an actor and not to do that, not to pursue that discovery of yourself as a lifelong thing. And um, but for me, it's when, I guess the question is, when did I decide that I could put food on my table while, while doing acting, while taking acting seriously as a career? And that really comes from just finding people that would support me, that believes in me, and then landing that first role, and then keep rolling on from there. I mean, there's no overnight successes. And right now, far be it for me to claim to be a success yet. And I don't know if I'll ever get there. Even if I do, I won't ever say that because what's the fun in that, right? That's like a period. And for me, I just want um, a couple of to be continues after that. So, well, then, if not a success, maybe maybe I can ask the question in this way: When did you know that this was going to work? That you were going to be able to put food on the table? When did I know? Um, yeah. when, when I knew that this was going to work and when I could put food on the table is when I had the realization that I don't need a lot of food on my table to be able to live <laughs> and to be able to do what I like. Um, and then when I found out that I really wanted to d devote my entire life to this, um, is when I started finding out how little it takes out of me to affect a lot of other people. When I did Power Rangers and we were doing press for it, I had so many kids just coming up to me and so many adults just coming up to me telling me how much Power Rangers have changed their life. I watched Power Rangers growing up as a kid and I always thought it was kind of a little thing that I enjoyed myself. I didn't know that I was sharing in this global phenomenon that would touch people in Europe, in Brazil, in Asia, and in North America. But I had so many people coming up to me, telling me that it, this little teenage show had helped them through some of the most difficult times in their life. Um, and that's way beyond how it affected me personally. So that's what I want to do, is I want to influence people um, as much as possible. And I want to make sure that I can inf influence them positively because I don't want to, you know, it's not, it's not my prerogative to lead the world down into Armageddon. So I need to, at the same time, cultivate myself to become better and better so that, that I make sure whatever I put out there is a negative for humanity, is a negative for the universe, you know? Yeah. D does that philosophy impact the roles that you go after? It doesn't impact the roles that I go after, but it impacts how I portray those roles. Um, it impacts, I guess, yeah, it, it does impact the roles that I select. Um, but before I reject those roles, I always try to see, I always try to see the bigger picture. First of all, what role does it, 
does this character play in the entire story, whether the story will impact the world in a positive way. And then whether I can find a different perspective on how to play these roles. What was it like, I mean, you brought up Power Rangers, what was it like being in the reboot of a series that you watched growing up? I mean, it was, was that closing a loop? Was that a, a childhood dream? It was a surprise. Okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, I'll give you a little statistic. 99% of actors are out of work. So to land a role mm-hmm. like that, especially being, especially being an Asian working in the North American industry, and this is just a few years ago. This was before Crazy Rich Asians, before um, Always Be My Maybe, before uh, even The Farewell that came out recently, a little indie movie that did more than $13 million in box office, and it's 70% Mandarin. And this is, I'm talking about in North America. Um, Before those things, but being an Asian, going from auditioning for roles that are like, um, may I take your order? You know, um, here's your fortune cookie or bracket, Chinese gangster yelling, um, close bracket, just make up the lines as you go along to having a lead role in a superhero film where the cast is truly diverse. That really changed my life, and that was a that was a hint for me that changes are coming. There's something brewing in the waters, you know. And um, I had a feeling back then, and I think it's coming true now. Now you talked about what it was like watching these. I think we can call them token roles given to Asian actors, you know where as you said, the dialogue really didn't even matter and may not have even been written. Was that frustrating for you? Because as you said, you know, there's a shift happening and it's, it's amazing to watch. And I, now I'm personally very thankful for it because, you know, we, we, should, we should not have a media uh, landscape that is so, so grossly misrepresentative of the population. It should, you know, it should be it should be reflective you're in the midst of being able of of not just watching but participating in this shift what was it like early on was that you know was that emotionally difficult for you watching these these roles you know being given out as as you said you know can i take your order you know it's really interesting it's really interesting that you use the word token jeremy and that's something that was frustrating to me and it's something that's still frustrating to me to this day. Um, I don't understand the phenomenon of tokenism. Um, I love playing video games when I was a kid. I go to arcades a lot, but I didn't think that I was a token until I really started noticing how come there's always only one Asian on screen. And that felt like the token Asian. And they really didn't get a lot of airtime, they didn't get any lines, they would just sit there being Asian as of as if the media was saying, Well, we'll give you we'll give you one just to um just to quiet you guys down. And literally they were really quiet. When you watch a lot of these Asian roles, they didn't speak very much at all. They're just there, kind of like um an animal at the zoo where you walk by and you go, Oh, that looks interesting. Hmm, it's there, that's nice. Um, and when you use the word, um, there's no representation, no equality. And, and for me, I mean, having been born in China and then moving around the world and having been, um, received part of my education in North America and grown up around the American culture, I think there's something beautiful in this. There's something beautiful in that everyone gets the right to talk about what they want. Everyone gets um, this idea of equality and this idea of everyone getting a good chance to pursue happiness that they deserve. And for me, a step further from equality is equity is what you deserve. So for me, it's not even about the number, the percentage that represents the percentage of the population, the percentage of Asians on screen that should equal 
the percentage in the population. But it's about it's about deserve. It's about who deserves. It's about equity rather than equality. And someone else had coined this. This isn't my idea. But equity is about what you deserve. Equality is about the proportion of percentage that you should have. What you deserve amounts to what the country is founded upon, and who participated, and who is owed from history. And believe me, Asians are owed a lot from history, and similar to a lot of minorities. But for me, I mean, I'm selfish as well because I feel this keenly and personally. I feel like that's not being reflected. We've always our voices have always been suppressed, and we've been stereotyped in ways where it's untrue and it's affected and impacted the ability for for our community to contribute back to this American culture and then further on to a global culture. Um, because we have a lot of good ideas, we have a lot of good expressions, um, things like martial arts. And because a lot of Asians don't feel like they have the ability to express those things. And martial arts, again, the art of it is an expression. When you don't feel like you can express it, you just become reclusive and cultivate it within your own community, within your culture. And you don't have a platform or a means to share that with the world. And media is that is the best way to share those things. So um, one thing I want to do and hopefully I, it won't take the rest of my life to do this, is to destroy that idea of tokenism of Asians. At least give us two. Come on. At least give us <laughs> two people on the screen. Just one more so we can kind of relate with, because there is something visually important about seeing people that look like you, that you can relate to. You know, there is something that automatically, it's a shortcut, like before when I said, Healing is a shortcut to thinking. That visualization is a shortcut to people explaining to you, you know, um, although this person is experienced, looks different than you and come from a different surrounding and doesn't have the same cultural background, but they share the same challenges as you. But all you need to do is show a person that looks like you on screen with a group of people that looks like you on screen to realize that, you know, you're not alone in this world. A lot of people feel alone because um, the worst thing is they don't see themselves represented in the most popular form that we get, which is the media. We get it on our cell phones, on our TVs, um, streaming on the big screens, right? First of all, the worst thing is you don't see yourself in it at all. And then second, second um, most detrimental to that is you only see that one person on screen. So you always think that you're the only person like that in the world, but you're not. A quarter of the population of the entire world is Chinese, is Asian. And how, how come we don't see that on screen? I mean, a quarter of the entire world is like that, where we have these massive fantasy shows. <laughs> One of my, just going off on a tangent, you might have to reel me yeah, back in here, Jeremy. All right. All One right, of my ready. favorite genres, one of my favorite genres is fantasy. One of my favorite novels is the Song of Ice and Fire um, series, which a lot of people know by the Game of Thrones because the TV show has been way more popular than the books. Um, but how many Asians did you see in the Game of Thrones over eight seasons? I, I don't recall any. You don't recall any? Well, there was one, and she was a sex <laughs> slave, and she got killed in the episode after that. So how come... I mean, how come you have these wonderful authors and screenwriters that can dream of fantastic worlds with dragons, um, ancient knights wielding laser sabers in a galaxy far, far away, but you can't even picture one single Asian in these worlds. Is there some kind of supervillain out there creating a Holocaust for Asians in these fantasy worlds? I don't understand. So... Either there's something very myopic or short-sighted in the purview of the Western media in general of imagination, or, um, or also Asians need to take responsibility for ourselves and speak out more. 
rather than believe in the false narrative that you don't have a voice, that you're weak, that you're not worthy of being represented because you are, and you have a lot of things to contribute. So don't just be reclusive and kind of hold those things in your own chest. Let it out, let it out, let that voice out, you know, breathe for once and just scream if you have to, but get your voices out there, get your representation out there, get your opinions out there. That's important. Yeah. Yeah, and and it seems like that there's been some some screaming. Crazy Rich Agents did amazing at the box office, and I think it opened up some people's eyes to say, "Hey, there's a demographic here that we've been tokenizing, that want to be represented, that want to identify, want to feel like they're not alone." What are other ways that people can shout and yell and and make people hear them beyond you know spending their dollars in certain ways? I think spending your dollars um, in our in our materialistic, um, I think Keanu, Keanu Reeves once coined the term materiality. So in this society, dollar is power, and dollar is the most direct way to show your support for something. So don't make crazy, don't make that phenomenon, don't make crazy rich Asians a token, because the only the the other movie, the last movie that came out that had an all Asian cast in North America that was shown on the big screens was Joy Luck Club. And that was 25 years ago before Crazy Rich Asians. So don't let Crazy Rich Asians, and by the way, I I, I think we're pretty lucky that two sequels are in the works on this. Um, Don't let that be a token phenomenon. Keep that going. Show your support for Asian films, show your support for Asian cast, and let that broadcast out there. And show your support in for diversity in general, but make sure that diversity is not just referring to black and white. Make sure colored people are not black and white. Because if you grew up in Asia, and this is to me sometimes in America, I I feel like people think this is racial. It's a slur, but it's not because in Asia we call ourselves Huangzhongren, which literally means yellow people, and that history comes from um, the fact that the Chinese people, our civilization, was brought up around the Yangtze River in um, in China, in Chinese, that's Huanghe, Yellow River. So because the river, the dirt was yellow, so we drank that water and we called themselves, and that water gave us life. So we're like the descendants of the Yellow River, the Yellow people. Um, so there's no stigma towards that. I feel like I feel like a lot of times we've been sold this false narrative of of a stigma. Some, there's something inherently wrong in being Asian. There's not. Even the Asian accent, if I start talking like, you know, if I talk like this, uh, be like water, like a Bruce Lee accent, then people go, oh, you know, that's not so wrong. But other Asian accents you hear on screen, you always think that, it's unattractive or you don't want to portray it. I hear a lot from Asian actors um, against portraying characters and accent or portraying, even portraying martial arts roles because they don't want to be stereotyped as that Kung Fu role. But my thinking is that that's the wrong way to think about it because inherently there is nothing wrong with accent. What's wrong with a British accent? What's wrong with a European accent? What's wrong with a French accent? If there's nothing wrong with those things, what's wrong with the American accent for that matter? If there's nothing wrong with those things, how come there's something wrong with an Asian accent? There's not. It's just that you've been sold the story that this accent is no good, is unattractive. There's nothing wrong with a martial arts role. It's just that you've been sold the story that a martial arts character can only be portrayed in a certain way. It's only a stereotype when other people put that on you. It's just like um, martial arts has been portrayed as a violent thing. It's martial arts is completely the opposite. The more you study it, the more you know that it's the opposite. So when you personalize it, when you find the meaning of it in yourself, then it stops becoming a stereotype. So um, my answer to how to get this out there and how to be an activist for support in um, 
and minority rights for support in Asian representation, for support and just having more fun in life because there's just more things to explore for everyone, um, is to personalize things, get your voice out there, um, make things your own, make things unique and express what you want to say. Okay. I can dig that. Now, the timing of this, I, I, I brought this up to you uh, before we started recording. The timing of our conversation today is not too long after the public announcement of another role that you're taking on. And, and listeners, I know I, I don't usually do research. And, and to be perfectly honest, this just popped into my newsfeed because of what it is. Um, but are you, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Because personally, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm always excited Good. to get work. It means I get to eat, like I told you. It really means I get to put food on the table and I get to um, prove to my mom that it wasn't a mistake in dropping out of med school and pursuing acting. And um, it's a new challenge, a new chance to see a character in a different way. Um, so the film you're referring to, I think, is... Um, the sequel to the latest Fast yeah. and Furious, Fast and Furious 23? Actually, no, no. that's not the one. I'm joking. What I was talking I'm about. Joking. <laughs> it's Mortal Kombat. So the movie you're referring yeah. to is Mortal Kombat, yes? Yeah. And yeah, so I get to play Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat, um, originally portrayed by Robin Shu, which is such an amazing phenomenon, like such an amazing a miracle. I mean, back then, when do you see a cool Asian lead? in any American film. Right. Um, right. Yeah, people grew and, up on that series. It's like Street Fighter. Authentic. When that felt authentic, when that felt cool, when that felt strong, when that felt inspiring, all those things. It's pretty wonderful. Um, so I was really stoked. I mean, I haven't played, I haven't played video games for quite a while. And when I found out that it was a possibility, I immediately added that Mortal Kombat to my shopping cart and got a Nintendo Switch. But I held on to it because it was, you know, you never know when it's actually real until you sign a contract. So I had that thing. I had that video game sitting in my shopping cart for like three months. Just in kind of a state of flux and purgatory, wondering wh whether or not this is actually going to come true. And the day I signed the contract, I immediately purchased it and I've been playing the video game ever since. Um, but there's just so now, many now stories I have to from Mortal Kombat. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, got, I got to ask the question. I got to ask the question. When you're playing, who are you playing as? I'm are only, you playing? I'm, I'm are only you playing as... No, I'm only playing as Liu Kang. So I've got... I've literally got one of the best jobs in the world, guys. This is why you guys should pursue the arts and become actors, because this is a part of my job, playing video games. A part of my job is watching movies, is reading stories, is thinking about how to make things more fun, how to make things more interesting. That's entire, that's, I mean, the proof of my devotion to work is the calluses on my thumb <laughs> from button smashing. Um, Growing up, I used to call that Nintendo thumb with my friends. It's so awesome. That's right. I mean, the proof of how hard I work is my Nintendo thumb. Um, how many how many accountants can say that? <laughs> I mean, all day. <laughs> this is it for now. I'm only playing Liu Kang until until the movie is wrapped. Until I'm uh, until mission accomplished. So um, and it, it does really help. It's really fun to. Um, to see what what's out there. Not not that I'm saying my entire character will be based on the video game, and all I'll do are lines that um, you know after you finish a fatality on someone. But it's actually pretty fascinating because the video games have followed their own storyline as well. I found out in Mortal Kombat 11, Liu Kang is is dead, so <laughs> he's like uh, some sort of zombie. I still have to delve back into the story, so um, because I'm just getting started in learning all the combos and cool stuff and generally making amends with um, video games. That's eaten a large portion of my life um, since I was a kid. Um, mm. But yeah. There's been cool. a lot of Mortal Kombat stuff between the movies and the games and 
There's and everything. And, and if I'm, and so there's, I mean, there's a lot for you to, to dig into. And if I'm, I, I've got my fingers crossed, you know, there's, there's, there's this one um, rather beloved and to my knowledge, completely persistent actor from the Mortal Kombat universe who, you know, has, has been Scorpion in every iteration. That's uh, Chris Casamassa, Shion Chris Casamassa, who's been on the show. And so my, I, I, I've looked, I actually haven't seen anything that he's coming in to play Scorpion in this movie. And I don't know if you're able to say anything, but my fingers are crossed because he's a great guy. I definitely won't say anything because I only go into movies fresh and I hate spoilers. Okay. I don't even watch trailers. Um, I just know what I want to see. And I just try to stay, you know, plug my ears and go in as clean as I can. So I think people should experience it that way. But I didn't know that Scorpion was one pearl line through the entire um, entire universe of Mortal Kombat. I had no idea. I used to, yeah, I to always my... loved Sub-Zero, um, but that's really cool. Hmm. I didn't he's know that done, at all. To my knowledge, he's done mm-hmm. the voice or the, the acting for every incarnation. Uh, it's something that we talked about a little bit when he was on the show, and he's just so passionate about the character. And if you, if anybody out there follows Xion Chris on social media, you'll see that he, you know, people send him fan art, and he's, he's just he posts it all the time. He's just so so honored and proud, and you know, he's a he's a martial artist. He runs a martial arts school. That's so awesome. You know, he's still one of us. Yeah, mm. yeah he's a good good guy. So, what about the future? We've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. When you, when you look forward, you know, and that could be as, as close to your feet or as far to the horizon as you want that to be. What are you seeing and what are you hoping for? The future. I don't know, because you, you interview, this is your thing, is interviewing martial artists. So yeah. do you ever get the answer that, I mean, there is no future. It's just the present. And I learned that from martial arts. Maybe once or twice. But it's certainly yeah. not common. People, people generally, when I ask them this question, they talk about their goals. They talk about what they want to accomplish. They talk about, you know, like, you know, when I'm 80 and, and looking back on my life, I hope I have done these things. You know, there, there's... And may, maybe they're just trying to give me what I'm asking for. Maybe they're not trying to give the honest answer, which you are here just, just living in the moment, which is something we all could probably do better at something i need to work on for sure yeah for me the more have you ever been a goal-driven person for me the more i do this the more i realize that goals are just direction and kind of the future is an illusion because the future is an expectation it's one of an infinite amount of possibilities and it's just such a tiny possibility i mean one mm-hmm. what's one in infinity is zero is nothing so, um, but the future is an expectation, is a direction that I'm, I want to aim for, but that's based on the present. You know what I'm saying? I do. It's like I my do. present so want gives me that direction for the future. And I've talked about all those wants already is, um, is for the future. I want, I mean, I want to recognize what's living, limiting myself right now. And a lot of those limiting beliefs are are false or illusions things like money that's false because what is money money is just energy um what is time time is false time is something that we we give ourselves to do things at a point that we're expected to do them but really what's so important in that why do we go to sleep when we're supposed to go to sleep i mean i start this year I've been starting to get up at three in the morning to train for maybe like four to five hours sometimes. Um, and that doesn't really matter to me because time doesn't really matter. I mean, when you have it, why don't, why don't you just devote everything to what you enjoy doing? It's not a training. is not a task that I hate. It's something I love. So why don't I, why don't I get up early in the morning just because it's dark outside? That doesn't really matter, right? You can be awake when it's dark and you can get to see the sunrise when it comes up and the sunset when it goes down. It's great. So in the moment, in this, in this present moment, I want to destroy some of those beliefs that are limiting, limiting, limiting me 
and what I want to do. And one thing that's limiting me right now is the pronunciation of the word limiting, apparently. <laughs> um, and then I want to, I want to affect people. I want to, I want, I want to pursue the truth. I want, I want fairness. I want justice. And a part of being that is bringing representation to those who are underrepresented. Um, especially personally to me are the Asian population, um, my friends and family. So that's what it is for me for the future. It's just based on everything that in the present that I want. And that's, that's the direction. And I don't really expect too much from it, but I want to do something. I want to do something huge, you know? Mm. You know, we've, we've had quite a number of people involved in the film industry on this show. People have, you know, folks from, from Daniel Wu to, to Shannon Lee. And oh, cool. Your conversation today has been very, very different. You know, you've, you've been incredibly open and it, it's clear that you are really thoughtful in what you're doing. And my hope is that as you move forward, that directors will give you the space to let this part of your personality come through because it, it seems like even though you're saying you're focused in the moment, um, you know, I think you can be beacon doesn't feel like the right word, but you know, a clear signal that everyone can, can look to, to follow regardless of, of their cultural heritage. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be excited to watch you, you know, on screen and, and in your future projects, but I've got, as we start to wind down here. I want to take a twist on a question that I often ask. Often I'll ask people if you could train with anybody anywhere in the world. But I'm going to ask you if you could do a movie with anybody from anywhere in the world, anywhere in time. Because time time isn't real, as you said. Who would who would you star opposite in that movie? Oh god, I don't know why, but that that just gave me goosebumps. Who would I, from any time, anywhere in the world, who would I start? It really depends on the movie. I mean, gosh. can be any genre. You get somebody that comes out of nowhere. They say, you know what? Here's a $50 million budget. I don't even care if we break even. I just want to be involved in this process. And, they, and they've watched you on screen and and you're their favorite actor, and they just want to see you, I guess, in, in a bit of a producer and a director seat as well, and help you bring your vision to light. And, and there's a time machine, and bam, who else, who else is in that movie? Okay, so I'll tell you what, Jeremy, since we're talking about martial arts, I would love to do a martial arts sci-fi epic. Going mm. back, to the beginning of martial arts, to the Neanderthals and the cavemen, and see how they oh. fought. And then throughout time, tracing that in every single lineage, in every single culture of martial arts, to the future, to see what we're gonna explore then with cybernetics and robotics and virtual reality and video games, all that combined into one, to see how it turns out then. And like then a martial arts like version of Doctor Who. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. That would be a great... Wouldn't that be an awesome I'd watch TV that. series? I'd watch that all That'd day. Be incredible. That'd be incredible. With um, maybe like a bathtub time machine, too. Me and Trapple in that. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be amazing. But truly, um, again, I would... Oh, God, I would... I'm just so... I mean, I, I told you I came late to Bruce Lee and his legacy. But I'm just so inspired by him and so fascinated by the person himself. He had so many, he was so charismatic. And for me, I know, I know that I'll never get the chance to meet the real person. So this thing in my mind has become so iconic that, you know, he had so many facets to him. He loved dancing. He loved music. He loved American culture. He embraced the Chinese side of him. He loved martial arts. Yeah, you love to have fun as well, to party, to rock and roll, right? So, and then, and then at the core of that is his philosophy, his expression, because that really was a paradigm shift for me. When he, when he said that um, the best form is no form, 
because the best form is your personal expression, and that's martial arts. And that's not only martial arts, that's art. Art, to me, is something that comes within you um, that affects another person. And that's truth. And there's no... And this is told to me by... Um, by a sensei of mine, by a shufu, um, previously, saying that when you're, you know, when you're on a stage, when you're in the ring, there's no line because your phys- your your expression is a physical physical expression. When you hurt someone, when you punch someone in the face, there's no line there. You know what I mean? Your language is everything you can utilize within your body. When it hurts, it hurts. There's no prevarication, there is no dancing around the subject. The subject is whoever goes down, goes down. And it's a beautiful thing because that's why people become friends after they fight. That's why I've, I've, become, I've become best friends with almost every single person I fought in the past, all my, all my bullies. Because after you fight, you've shared the truth and there's no denying that truth and you've shared something special. And I think to me, that's the core of martial arts. Um, so to come back to the question, um, I, I would, I would die very happy if I ever got a chance to perform my Bruce Lee, <laughs> and that mm-hmm. might only be able to be accomplished in my dreams, or who knows, some technology that comes along in in the future. That'd be super cool. Mm. Well. This has been great. If people want to find you, you know, social media, websites, any of that, where where do they go? You know, if people want to find me, they can find me. <laughs> I don't want to promote myself so much. So um, I think people are pretty smart out there. If they want to find me, they can find me. My name's Ludi Lin. It's easy to find. Okay. And of course, we're going to drop those links in the show notes. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, people. So you can, even though he's not going to promote himself, we're, we're going to make sure you get easy access to all that stuff over there. Yeah, if they can find you, they can find me. That's right. That's right. I mean, they already they already found us. I mean, if they're listening right now, they found us in some way. There you go. As, as much as I would, as much as I would like it, uh, it's not socially acceptable for me to go house to house and say, "Hey, listen to this." Uh, so you know, that's not part of our ad, our marketing platform. But let's <laughs> let's end it off. We got uh, we got one way that we we send out every episode, and that's what parting words, what advice, what wisdom. Just what do you want to leave the audience with today as we close out? Um, oh, God, far be it for me to give advice. Um, but I can pass along a really good piece of advice. A couple of pieces of advice that's affected me in the past. One um, is by one of, my, one of my colleagues, one of my agents, actually. And she's a, she's an amazing jujitsu artist that trains here. But when she trains, she never wears um, her colored belt. She always wears her white belt. Um, I think that's very important. So never forget your white belt because you're always a student and there's always something to learn. Um, and white is emptiness, right? So you can only learn when you're empty. And this, another piece of advice that I received was by my makeup artist. Um, and she said, don't take this too seriously. Never take it too seriously, you know? And, um, that's because life is just temporary. And then actually one more piece of advice, and this is personal. This is coming from me. All right. No matter what you do, you have to love the way you suck. Because you're going to suck at a lot of things. So you're going to get better, but only if you love the way you suck. If you don't love it, then you won't work at it and you won't get better. But if you work at it and you really love the way you suck, you will get better and you will succeed. And that's it. What a great conversation. I learned a lot, had a lot of fun. And I hope you can see what I'm seeing now that this man is headed for greatness. I have no doubt of that. So thank you, Mr. Lin, for coming on the show. I hope to talk to you again. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. 
see the photos, the links to his social media, his website, all that stuff right there. And don't forget, whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15 to get 15% off. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. And my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.